I am, uh, I've been a professor at, in the Institute of Science, and then I moved to Delhi from Bangalore, northern part of India, and I uh, initiated to establish genomics in India and establish a very famous institute, which is called in CSI Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, CSI IGIB, which is today uh, in very high profile because it has developed uh, a very, very fast, high-tech, uh, CASPAS, CASPAS-based, CRISPR-based COVID diagnostics. So you can see it's a very high-tech uh, institution. Uh, so when I did this, I realized that drug discovery uh, is becoming more and more expensive in, in 2000, whereas the genomics people were pushing from $100 million a genome sequence and aspiring to make it a $1,000 sequence. I was a member of the XPRIZE for genomics, which opened the challenge for $1,000 genomics for genome sequencing. So it was very surprising to me why drug discovery is becoming expensive from millions to billion, whereas uh, genome sequencing is moving from $300 million going down. Uh, this surprised me because the science is becoming good. You can see we are today in an era. We are able to develop vaccine for COVID, you know, in 200 days, 300 days. Not even a year has turned around. So then why are we doing this? And why there is hardly a disease for tuberculosis or malaria, any new drugs comes up. And it turns out in thousands of drugs that got FDA approval, only 21 got neglected disease approval, which is about 1%. While there are 400 drugs is in clinical trial for cancer, whereas there'll be four or six drugs for tuberculosis. No wonder in 2000, we were using uh, 50 years old discovery uh, drugs and still thousand people were dying per day in India and many parts of the world, about 4,000 people die per day. Today you can see for COVID, when thousand people is dying in America, the whole world wakes up. Whereas when 1,000 people die in Africa, the world doesn't worry about it per day. So therefore, the neglected disease principle came because we have in India 2.8 million tuberculosis and 400,000 people die. And hardly there was any drug. We were still using 1960s drugs. So uh, my idea was let us try and see whether we can develop drugs. And why is it drug discovery becomes so much failure? The reason is, as you all have started learning about COVID, because now a lot of interest in biology has come, everybody's learning about SE2 receptors, buying about the immunity, vaccine, you know, antibody. So the idea was drug discovery takes place in silo. And each company does it very closed door, no open sharing. And younger people's participation is mostly like a technician rather than as an intellectual input. Whereas in 2000, you have seen the entire first decade of 2000, the explosion of information technology, the Facebook, the Twitter, the WhatsApp, all has come out by young people of 25 years age. So we have kept drug discovery to olders and young are not involved. Number two point K, second point, is that drug discovery is done very secretly. So lots of intellectual property protection becomes an important thing because idea was that with intellectual property protection, you actually benefit uh, the inventor or investor, but eventually it turns out to be benefit for the investor than the inventor. Look at the COVID. In COVID, the vaccines are coming faster because they have, all science has been made public. And when multiple people develop vaccine, automatically there'll be no monopoly in the field and the prices will fall. And it is very expected. 
I know the Oxford vaccine and Moderna vaccine are also manufactured at this moment in the generic laboratories of vaccine of India. So therefore, it will be available in a very affordable price. So it is a, actually a testimony of the concept of open source, which developed in 2006. First time, 2006, I came up with this idea. The reason I came up with this idea that we built a system, we wanted to build a system biology modeling. This is very computational. And one realized that, you know, an aircraft today, a Boeing 777 or Airbus 320 flies absolutely flawlessly, but before it is manufactured, it is completely designed, developed in computer, flown in computer, crashed in computer, landed in computer, and then it's manufactured. Whereas Wright Brothers aircraft in 1902 until 747 were prototypes. So the drug discovery has remained in Wright Brothers era. It has not moved into the modern era where artificial intelligence, computational modeling extensively utilizes to make drug discovery. Now, the, what is the problem? There are millions of papers in the literature. You need to read those. So when we wanted to do for tuberculosis, we realized there are only 4,000 genes. The genome is available from 1960. You know, 98 by Pasteur Institute, whereas still 2007, hardly it was annotated to understand actually all these genes mean. We realized we have to read about 54,000 papers. So we involved and crowdsourced students, 1,200 students, to read papers and assimilate all the gene function and eventually build a system biology model by which we could computationally, you know, if you look at the whole reaction by which a cell works, it's very complex. Microbiology will put you up a poster. The moment a computer scientist sees this, he will run away. He said, forget about it. If you have entered biology lab, you will see those horrendous posters where nothing you understand looking at it. So our argument was, can we take and convert it to a computer model? So we built and we discovered there are 1,152 reactions that takes place in bacteria to double, involved in 890 genes, and this reacts with the reactants and to make double. So one bacteria becomes two, two becomes four, like that it goes. Now this, we had to put them in a computer so that we can actually knock out gene by gene in computer and we actually were successful. And to do this project and to do experimental validation of those targets, identify the targets, we needed larger bandwidth. So we decided to have it entirely open source, involved experimentalists. So we involved 100 laboratories, 8,700 researchers from 130 countries participated without any border. It's like a like our, your Swiss uh, doctors beyond borders. So it was research beyond borders. And it involved people from all parts of the world, even from you know an Indian project in which we had even people participating from Pakistan. So you can see it was borderless. This is was the foundation, the idea is. So we were first, our targets were to look at repurposed drugs, and we discovered a, a type 2 diabetes drug called metformin can actually act as an adjunct therapy along with the tuberculosis. And now this is the first time the whole idea of crowdsourcing and open source for drug discovery was initiated. What was the argument in favoring an open source? You know, Linux hardware, people know Linux is an open source. and But Linux makes business. Linux is running in 90, 95% of the supercomputers of the world. IBM, Craig, everybody uses Linux. Android is open source. But for Android, we would not have had telecommunication so cheaper. And therefore, model of IT is translated into drug discovery. The idea is that you will make it affordable. The moment you make it affordable, it is accessible. 
and then it is a larger number of groups. You can imagine, you can create a vaccine which will be, which cost could be thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollar. Yes, then only one million people will use it. But the moment you make it to ten dollars, it's accessible to all. So it's a question of India's capability of generic drug uh, development and make it affordable. Like we have done this for HIV, and you know half the world uses uh, Indian vaccine, and half the world uses the Indian generic drugs. So therefore, idea was if we can make discovery open and share among everybody, then it will be very low cost. So, so this is a very simple approach. And I'm glad to see that it didn't take much time. It is, it is about a decade, a 10 years time, today, maybe 12 years, that COVID hit us. And the whole world said, we should go solidarity trial. We should share open data. So you can see with the nature science, everybody, Lancet, everybody opened up all scientific data to public access, like an open source journal. And that's what the science sharing has led to. So the whole principle was, if we share knowledge without holding proprietary, the belief is very simple. It has worked for computer science. Why not? So can we not make a Linux for pharma? So this is what open source. I was fortunate because I was, I was the director of the institute when I started. And when I did the first piece of work between 2002 and 2007, and 2007, I was asked to uh, head the national chain of laboratories of CSIR, which means my position was ex like a CNRS president or Max Planck president, having 40 laboratories and having 6,000, 7,000, 6,000 students, 8,000 technicians under my disposal and 12,000 students. So therefore, and the resource required. So there was a fully government funded resource, but I can tell you, we spent only $12 billion to make this project globally visible. When we began, even get, Bill Gates had a doubt about open source, several people had a doubt. And several people had a doubt about students getting involved into this knowledge sharing. But it turned out, in 10 years later, even the same Bill Gates says, we need an uh, open source initiative between the academia and industry to do so. So today, uh, I think the idea of open source drug discovery got validated. <coughs> even WHO has mentioned in COVID. So we are having hackathons. I am involved with the University of Paris CRE, the Center is such interdisciplinary, uh, which is an open innovation center where we, I, I'm a part of the International Advisory Board. And now CRE takes it over. So now we have an open source pharma foundation, which is funded by Tata Trust. And then it is now have office both in New York, Paris, as well as in Bangalore. So since I've formally retired from my chair. So till now till 2017, we completed the most of the TB work. Now this is gone in taken up by Indian Council of Medical Research under Indian TB Research Consortium. Originally under the leadership of Somia Swaminathan, she who is now the chief scientist of WHO, a TB expert. She was responsible for our open source drug discovery clinical trial. Now, the Indian Council of Medical Research has taken up several clinical trials with government funding, as well as some Tata Trust funding. So you can see what began with a small idea with students, eventually became a movement. And now it's, an, it's a worldwide, everybody wants to accept and adopt this model. And that's what the solidarity trial is all about. That is where the drug discovery discussion is all about. And what it means that <clears throat> we need to apply artificial intelligence, data simulation, multidimensional, multi-layer data to simulate and understand how a drug can be discovered. 
I think this is what will happen for COVID. You can see at what fast speed we have got repurposed drugs already in the in the clinical trial. And <clears throat> I'm sure the new drugs will come as we share knowledge and share with each other. I hope I've given you a reasonable introduction. So now, uh, you know, I mentor, I, I have taken up, you know, I, you know, I've done enough work. So I now only mentor. I don't take personal responsibility to execute. So I have been mentoring uh, Open Source Pharma Foundation. Uh, Dr. Jai Kumar Menon is the one who leads it and sitting in Bangalore. And then we have Indian Center for Social Transformation where I have a small unit working. Then the CSI OSDT part, some part of the work is done at uh, Chen Imtek Chandigarh, the IICT Hyderabad, and also, of course, the biggest servers, the, the computational databases that we developed, OSDD, CRDD, it is maintained by the GPS Raghava. And I can tell you, the, those servers are open source, and it gets 150,000 hits per day. So that's the contribution of the open source drug discovery initiated by India with a global participation. And now it's a movement of the world. You know, this is what started. I was the director general of CSIR. It was a CSIR project led by CSIR participation of Pan India with global participation. So that is how the project was formulated. And since it is open source, it is not owned by anybody. Okay, the database is open, everybody, and I can see we, our data was extensively used even at the Broad Institute side. You can go there. So I think Francis College, one side, in NIH started this open source sharing of resources for TV and other researches. I think this is where we, we showed that the computationally we can move forward. And we have the uh, drug depository, both from natural resource as well as chemical. We also got created uh, a molecular uh, library by involving students and faculties in the university system. CRI uh, at Paris has developed a very, very, very innovative idea, which uh, through synthetic gene design, and that got the iGEM prize. And that's where they're using uh, e -coli, modified E. coli with tuberculosis. You know, mycobacterium tuberculosis is very difficult to handle. You need BSL-3, BSL-4 facility, which is not easy for, you cannot handle students anywhere. But making a modified E. coli, they have been able to successfully do uh, a screening assay. So, you know, there are novel ideas shared. You know, when nobody cares who gets the credit, that's what my philosophy is, then a lot can be achieved. Idea is drug production should stay with the companies. See, why the companies, generic companies cannot invest in, you know, hiring people like us, people, thousands, hundreds of people will be very expensive. So if that knowledge is given free, then manufacturing, taking through clinical trial is always, clinical trial is at this moment supported by mostly by the government or uh, Tata Trust. And once it is successful, then it goes over to uh, pharmaceutical companies. So the whole model is the discovery can be open source, the data is shared open source, then the respective pharma companies can manufacture. The reason is simple. You know, penicillin has saved more people in the world, right? Many companies have made money out of penicillin. They didn't rob people out of penicillin. And penicillin was never patented, right? Microbiologists will tell me penicillin was never patented. Second World War, there was patented of penicillin and it would have been restricted. So therefore, my belief is healthcare is a right. 
healthcare as a business and healthcare as a right, there has to be balance. You can make profit, but not profiteering. And that's the whole principle of open source. I believe uh, all CEOs of the I, uh, big supercomputer companies will say that they make money, but they don't, you know, there are still Linux, which is open source. Even Apple, which was very close to op operating system, but that also, they have also created third party open source to create apps. And even Siri has become open source. So, you know, it is very, very important to understand that even in healthcare, the way genomic scientists shared knowledge as a part of the human genome organization and being a member of the Hugo Council between 2004 to 11, I have seen the sharing of this knowledge. And I was a member from 1990. This knowledge sharing has actually made genomic diagnostics affordable. If it was not, it would not have been possible. See, most of you might be able to do 23andMe, get your ancestry, get an idea, but you can see, $1,000, you can get an idea about all your uh, drug response, gene potential risk, depending on the country you are doing, because manpower is differently costed. In India, it's definitely been much cheaper because of manpower. It's a purchase power parity discussion. But it's still affordable. Most of the people can do it today. The beginning, pharma companies did not understand. I completely agree with you. But I think progressively they understood. That's why you can see uh, many of the DNDI and all many, many collaborations has happened. The, the foundations like Get Foundations and many of the foundations who puts money, they also realize this collaborative open source approach is beneficial. And COVID is a great example where now whole world everywhere people are sharing an open source. And that's why we are hoping that maybe next year we'll have the uh, drugs available. Vaccine is available earlier than drugs. And then vaccine, and already today, I think Moderna has announced. Oxford has already there. We have the vaccine for the uh, Pfizer. So once we have half a dozen vaccine, and they are manufactured in developing countries like, you know, countries like India, it will be very, very low cost. That's what, and then the government gets subsidy. You don't need to, but you can see when everybody is working, I can give a simple example, HIV. Mm -hmm. You know, when HIV happened, in five years, 25 drugs were developed. But it was still $10,000 for a treatment. But it is India who made those drugs cheaper. Okay, because there's a principle called compulsory licensing. I can tell you today, if there is a, just like hepatitis C drug by Gilead, that was $84,000. You know, anybody could have invoked compulsory licensing, but today this made in $800 in India. And that's with the collaboration with the company. Okay. Because the reason is simple. You can make a drug which will be used by 100,000 people or 10 million people. You can make 100,000 people paying for $50,000 or you can make 10 million people using for $50. And that's, that's all the difference is. You can see remdesivir is a generic drug. They were all developed as antiviral. Right now, you are re repurposing it for COVID, and it's only costing in India, uh, I think, 24 pounds. That's all, you know, less than $30. $30. So, <clears throat> whereas it may be $300 in America, or maybe a little more. Okay, but it's it's available. So it is availability, affordability goes together, makes it accessible. So whole principle of drug discovery to get 
availability, accessibility, and affordability in a chain of link. Where discovery, the laboratories, you know, the science has happened in the laboratories of Oxford, which is public funded. Correct? Then it goes to a company. So there has to be a decision how expensive it should be. It cannot be, you know, England will not go to agree. If somebody says you, you have a, you need $10,000 for a vaccine, forget it. Government will say compulsory licensing. You have no choice. So this is where the idea today, the world has understood for diseases that affect large number of people. We have to go open source. Even discoveries can be intellectual property yourself, but it does. It doesn't. It's like this. I own a property, but I give it for public use. I own a building, but I can still give it a public use. So there is no harm in owning, but you make it available to make it affordable, so that it is more available and accessible. That's the whole principles of open sharing. You know, I will say it's an open innovation, open sharing of knowledge. That's all is about open source. We borrowed the word open source from Linux, basically. The TRIPS agreement, TRIPS agreement allows any country to be part of is allows you to do compulsory licensing. Now, for like COVID is an example where the whole humanity is in trouble. Nobody can own it. It can it has it can be compulsory licensed to make it manufacture it by anybody else. So, but you don't have to invoke. I don't think anybody, any company wants to make a drug for COVID and wants to make it high price. That company share will crash. Everybody will go against that company. You know, this will be a disaster for that company. So nobody wants to get into this, you know. Since that's why the tuberculosis market is only $300 million. So nobody wants to spend a billion dollars. So that's what my argument was. Government spends a billion dollars annually on tuberculosis in India. $20 billion is an economic loss. So if you Google with me and with my papers, you will get every information there. Uh, <clears throat> that $20 billion is annual economic loss. In spite of 2005 to 2015, we have followed the WHO protocol. Unfortunately, we haven't got a drug which makes it faster recovery. And drug resistant tuberculosis is worse than COVID. I can tell you that. You, the death is inevitable. Percentage of people dying with drug resistant TB is far higher than people die in COVID. So one has to be very, very careful not to get that. And that's increasing in the world. And therefore, it is, you have two choices in life, I, according to me. You pay for the healthcare insurance by the government, especially in Europe where you have a healthcare coverage, which is a socialistic approach where everything is paid by the state, like England, or you do upstream investment to make drug discovery cheaper, right? And cost of it coming down to be affordable. So it's a question of government decision, whether you want to pay, let somebody else invest and develop, and then you will pay for the insurance or you will pay upstream to make discovery cheaper and share it. So that's what the Gate Foundation did. You know, many malaria and Dubai, many like they have invested money. And those early research, and even today, COVID, I have seen, you know, we have written a recent paper, which has come in, uh, you know, it's an it's open source journal involving all over the world. We have scientists, 78 scientists. And... Uh, Charles Offray of uh, France, Leo, who is also a believer of this open, you know, I have participated in Leo Meet, which is the open source, open science, open innovation. You know, Europe is more worried about open innovation. And, you know, sometimes we get overwhelmed by the other parts of the world, which believes market force only decides. But market force 
is not applicable when humanity is in trouble. And today, COVID has demonstrated that this pandemic, that when humanity gets in trouble, uh, so I, I give an example that there are, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie called Independence Day, uh, an English movie where we get an alien attack on the earth and then all countries, forces from America, Russia, Japan, China, all countries work together to save the earth. That's an example. When the world is attacked from outside space, the whole countries come together. So what is that? That time there is no division of people. Everybody is sharing everything. Coordination is going on. <laughs> Same way, COVID is an invisible alien has arrived. Right? So the whole world comes together. And they're sharing information, knowledge. You know, I, I have seen, you can see count the number of papers that has been made open source. The pre-publications have been made public. And it's unbelievable. It has never happened. Preprints are up all the time. Everybody is putting up data. And that's how the science happened. So open source, it will still take 10 more years, uh, according to me. Hope I will be alive. Uh, it will be still take 10 more years, according to me, to, it, to sink into the problem. That to say, we need to re-engineer our drug discovery model. We need to re-engineer our healthcare uh, cost. Because healthcare is no longer affordable for most of the people in many parts of the world. So therefore, it is absolutely necessary that we build a new model. And that new model will be open data sharing. We will have different clinical trial approach that will be open clinical trial. That means the patient themselves will come up and participate. There is a, there is a site called a Patient Like Me. So hundreds of thousands of patients collaborate. And it will happen for COVID. You will see that lots of people will collaborate to their why somebody has a symptom, why somebody doesn't have a symptom. Biology is still evolving. People are trying to understand. But all this knowledge is getting distributed instantaneously, much before it is getting published. And that's the, that's the spirit with which the world is working today. So, and that's what I call open source means open sharing. You know, Human Genome Project has created $147 billion in business in America. But the all genome data was public. So there is no relationship between business and sharing of information and open source. There's an article by Barnard Bono, and he and I share a lot of uh, common thought. 87% of clinical trials of phase three could be absolutely useless. We did not have to do it. We could have rejected them in phase one. Now, so we do bad science in many, many cases. One of the reasons is, as per FDA, you need to do only two clinical, last clinical trial of phase three, you need to do only two last clinical trial, maybe three. If you look at the number of clinical trials for a drug goes on in the world, it runs to 100, same drug, 100 clinical trials running. The reason is, you know, 30 years back, the CEOs of these companies were all the scientists. Pfizer, Bristol Mesqui, all scientists. Today, you know, the transition took place. Okay. And it all began to finance. CEOs of, are the finance people, market finance people. So if you see, I have been a member of the uh, pharma, pharma fund boards. So I know that if a company drops its clinical trial, knowing it is not going to be successful, then its market share goes down. So nobody wants to drop clinical trial. And each failure clinical trial adds cost. You can see today, Moderna vaccine is only 15,000, 15,000 to one trial, right? Clinical trial. The Pfizer clinical trial is about 43,000 people. 
right? There's no need to run 10, 20 clinical trials if your efficacy is good. So if a drug is very small difference from the existing drug, instead of stopping that very early, so phase one, computational modeling and computational approach to toxicity, all this approach can actually eliminate many, many molecules which will fail at a later stage. And once that is done, and there's a great example uh, that there is a drug recently <coughs> was done for uh, using AI, artificial intelligence, and it took 46 days, which took 10 years for the pharma companies and did not succeed. In 46 days, artificial intelligence computation followed by 21 days of experiments, the drug Came, drug was successful. So you see, this is what approach has to be. That we have to use a lot more computational approaches. I'm sure that artificial intelligence and machine learning is helping. And this has to be done by younger people. So therefore, you cannot have this too much secrecy and not involve young. I think the large pharma companies have to figure it out. So my personal feeling is, uh, many of this will undergo change. And if you don't change, you won't exist. It's very simple. Uh, my argument is, Facebook makes money, Google makes money, but it is accessible, affordable to all. So I think pharma has to learn the model from IT companies and figure it out how they can still make money. They don't, they cannot make, you know, they can make reasonable money. I can tell you the generic companies owners, I've worked with several of them in India. They all make money. It's not that they don't make money, but they don't make money and waste money enormously, right? And so it's, it's you know, I, I say, if you do good science, your cost of development will come down. But if you do a lot of bad science, your cost of development will go up. And good science can only be done when you involve younger people. And the more younger people brain is used by pharma, the better they are off. So the cultural transition is, Pharma has to learn from the uh, IT companies. And, you know, WhatsApp was developed by 50 people, right? And it was sold at what? You know, it's an incredible amount of money, right? I think I don't remember the exact value. I know it is in Indian rupees, 120,000 crores, which may be, I don't know, it will be about $20 billion plus. I don't know how, how big it was, but it's a lot of money. So therefore, it is possible that lots of small startups will come up with this AI-based drug discovery, and that is will be done by younger people. And since there will be many, just like your uh, smartphones, the price will drop because when you do many, many discoveries, and those discoveries will be distributed. Some will be, uh, maybe oh, mostly they will be patented, but you know, patent will run out and eventually drugs will get in the generic form. And if something is fantastic, like magic bullet, if you can, uh, if you can cure uh, any disease, let's say your disease COVID, I'm sure, uh, WHO and Solidarity Money, Trial United Nations will pay that company and take it and make it a generic available. I have no doubt about it. So if, if, so my belief is it is the younger generations with enormous computational capability, with domain experts, with large literature mining, uh, the text reading algorithm, literature mining, deep domain expertise like microbiologists and system biologists all coming together. I think they should, we should be able to see in next decade 
uh, a new way of drug discovery. You know, any movement takes time and we are in the second decade of this movement. By the time we complete the second decade, uh, by 2027, we will enter into third decade. And I think it will become, you know, it has happened for Android, it has happened for Linux, the same way it will happen. So you see, <clears throat> role of single discipline knowledge is obsolete. Everybody has to have multiple domain expertise. So we now biology has become too serious a subject to be left to the biologists. That's why the engineers and computer scientists are coming, right? So therefore, this is a new hybrid people are required who will be able to understand two domains and interact with. So my personal experience, I was very fortunate. I started as a structural biologist and moved on to biology B, and I was passionate about computing. So it was okay for, but you don't get too many people like that. So the, one of the thing I tell that uh, you need uh, an adapter, individuals who are, I call them adapters, who will understand biology, will understand computing and make the two people talk. And there's the one. So, you know, I do presently that job, uh, both nationally and internationally, because that's, that's the way, best way. Uh, it's not that easy, but I will suggest to anybody young biologist, please learn computing. Understand it's not too complicated. And those who are computer scientists, asking them to learn biology. And that's the future. As DB, you will get all lots of things. Now, I don't think uh, we are exclusive. Now, there is, a, there is a malaria project in Australia. There is a cancer project in and uh, Canada, there are many, many projects on open source. You can go to the OSPF site, open source pharma site. That also will give you some ideas. But this is OSPF is an offshoot of OSDD. And it is the Bernard Buno who thought of it simultaneously. Uh, but, you know, we implemented it. Thank you. Thank you very much.